Welcome to the Yoga Hour, offering insights and practices for spiritually, consciously living today. Here's your host, Yogacharya, Ellen Grace O'Brien. Welcome to the Yoga Hour, where we talk about yoga in all its depth and breadth <clears throat> as a path to spiritually conscious, fulfilled living today. I'm Dr. Laurel Trujillo, co-host and producer of the show, and our topic today is yoga, compassion, and resilience. Once again, I am here with founder and director of the Yoga Hour, Yogacharya Ellen Grace O'Brien. Yogacharya O'Brien was ordained to teach in the Kriya Yoga tradition in 1982 by her guru, Roy Eugene Davis, who was a direct disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda. Yogacharya O'Brien is an internationally acclaimed spiritual teacher, author, poet, and the founder and spiritual director of the Center for Spiritual Enlightenment, a Kriya Yoga meditation center with headquarters in San Jose, California. Yogacharya has published several books, including Living the Eternal Way and The Jewel of Abundance, as well as several books of poetry, including the award-winning The Moon Reminded Me. Her online classes include Arta 365 and Dharma 365. You can find out more about her, her books, and classes at her author website, ellengraceobrien.com, and the O'Brien is B-R-I-A-N, ellengraceobrien.com, and csecenter.org. You can also follow Yogacharya O'Brien on social media on Facebook at Ellen Grace O'Brien and on Twitter at Yogacharya Live. Welcome, Yogacharya O'Brien. I'm delighted to be back with you on the Yoga Hour. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo, and welcome to all the listeners uh, this morning and to the archive. It's a pleasure to be with you. So before we begin our dialogue about yoga, compassion, and resilience, let's begin with a moment of contemplation. Om. So let's start right where we are, wherever you are right now. Just begin by becoming aware of your body in space feeling all of the places that your body is supported. Perhaps you're sitting, you can feel your feet on the floor, perhaps you are walking or standing. And just really bring your attention to the here and now. And let's turn our attention to the breath and just notice as we take a fully conscious breath and inhale and exhale. On the next inhale, noticing the cool air entering the nostrils. And on the exhale, noticing the warm air flowing out. And just staying right here, right in this present moment. Resting in this moment. Here's something to contemplate, taken from Yogacharya O'Brien's book, Living for the Sake of the Soul. Sometimes life can break your heart. No one escapes its sorrows. Yet in the midst of every sorrow is the persistent rising sun of truth, illuminating every situation with the light of I am that. Beyond any circumstance, deeper than any pain or sorrow, the blessed self shines through pro proclaiming, Arise, awake. Beyond any circumstance deeper than any pain or sorrow, the blessed self shines through, pro proclaiming, Arise, awake. Once again, Yogacharya, I'm delighted to be with you <clears throat> Excuse me, today on the Yoga Hour. 
it's wonderful to be able to speak with you during this time when so much is happening in our world. And and I particularly liked that quote that I started with. I liked the um, arise, awake. It was reminding me of, of uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, how he would uh, often address a, an audience and say, are you awake and ready? <laughs> um this time of the COVID-19 pandemic is a challenging one, obviously, for many of us, as our lives have changed dramatically in such a short period of time. I personally have found that my practice of yoga and meditation is even more important to me. Perhaps this is because, as the Bhagavad Gita states, that even a little bit of the practice of yoga removes great fear. So, what I want to ask you is, why is this so? What is it about the practice of yoga that removes fear? Well, thank you first um, for hosting today and for the beautiful meditation. Um, you know, the quote about, um, you know, as you say, that comes from the Bhagavad Gita, a little bit of this practice. Um, it's referring to the practice of meditation, uh, the practice of being able to anchor our attention and our awareness in our essence of being, uh, in our spiritual nature, which is untouched, it's unchanging, it's unmoving, it's not subject to circumstance. So, um, once we're able to touch that, uh, we have a sense of stability, a sense of ground. And, you know, fear uh, takes place in the mind, in the mental field, not, not in the soul nature. Fear takes place in the mind. So with a little bit of practice of yoga, we learn that we are supreme consciousness itself. We are spiritual beings. We are the witness with the capacity to observe the mind and so we a little bit of practice gives us that distance that we need which is is really the key i think you know we need some appropriate dis distance from what arises in the mental field and scares us <laughs> and so um that's what yoga does. It, it gives us the direct experience of what we are as spiritual beings. Um, and, and in that, you know, we are free from fear and we can observe fear. It's not that fear doesn't arise um, because, of course, it does. And it does um, very often for good reason. But we don't have to... Um, be overwhelmed or overcome by that fear. So yoga gives us, I would say, uh, appropriate distance from it. Well, thank you for that. And and that's certainly been my experience and why, as I mentioned, it, it is so important for me personally, it just feels so essential to have um, my steady meditation practice at this time so we can, so I can dip into that um, get away from, you know, the churning of the mind and, and my fears. So um, how, what is your relationship with your practice at this time? How, how has it been helpful to you? I think the main thing about my spiritual practice that I've observed during this time of change is that I know what to do. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that I always do it. Um, we, and we're going to get into, you know, compassion and resilience in our conversation this morning. And of course, this compassion and self-compassion is a, is a part of that. But it's so helpful that um, yoga gives us a whole toolbox, you know, of how to take care of the body, the mind, the emotions, the environment, you know, how to eat in a balanced way, how to have a regular routine to bring you more uh, stability, um, all of those things. So I think that has been the greatest um, blessing for me at this time that I know what to do and I know the tools of yoga work and so you know sometimes just unavoidably my routine gets interrupted and that's been of course one of the main things I've seen during this time it hasn't been so easy to completely have you know things turned upside down 
and uh, and not just in terms of the outer environment, but the inner environment. You know, where we're we're really trying to grapple with um, the great sorrow um, that is close to us. It, you know, in our own circles of people that we know. And then, of course, farther away in terms of the global situation. So for me, it's been that my practice is comprehensive and I know what to do. And there are many areas where I can make adjustments, you know, whether that is adding in an extra meditation um, or making sure I do some asana practice because I've been sitting in front of my computer too much or um, making sure that I'm eating um, healthy foods to the best of my ability, you know, things like that. So I know what to do. That's what I would say. Mm. Oh, that's great. So in uh, in talking about how, you know, this practice can remove great fear, I thought it would be important to to talk about yoga in its, you know, largest sense, yoga philosophy, um, which is obviously far beyond what, what many people may think of when you say yoga may think of it more of in a limited way of just these physical, you know, practices for the body. But as you mentioned, it really, there is something for, you know, for, for everyone, for every part of our lives. So as an overview of yoga, I was going to ask you to go over the four sutras that you condensed, kind of condensed all of yoga into these four sutras. So can you go over those for us? Oh, sure. These are, um, sutras that I, I wrote about in my book, uh, Living the Eternal Way. And um, I just thought it would be helpful to have this little formula, you know, that we could commit to memory. And in a way, it's uh, it's like a first aid kit, you know. Uh, so I suggest committing them to memory. And the first sutra is, it is... And that refers to, you know, one absolute supreme reality being the source and the substance of all that is, that is both transcendent and eminent, that is the source, that is the substance, it is the support. So we we start with this understanding that there's one omnipresent reality, you know, and, and the yogis say it was called by many names, you know, God, spirit, however you want to call it. But the first step is understanding that there is only one, one reality, and that reality is omnipresent. And that is the unchanging um, supreme consciousness. And because it's omnipresent, you know, if we if we begin to contemplate this concept of omnipresence, everywhere present at all times, um, then we understand that we cannot be separate from that which is omnipresent. It's in, it's impossible. You just use your discernment to begin to think about it, and and um, it sounds uh, so logical, um, and yet you know I know even for myself, you know, many years when I was trying to comprehend the nature of God, what is God, what is truth, um, I had heard, you know, God is omnipresent. But somehow I still felt God was something else other than, you know, what I am and was somehow apart from me. And I had to go, you know, bang on the doors of heaven, you know, to try to find God. Um, but, you know, what yoga showed me is that that which is all that is, we cannot be separate from it. We can't get outside of it. We are it. And the classic... Um, you know, metaphor that's used is that we're like waves on the ocean of consciousness. So we are emanations of that and we are that. So the second sutra is we are it. And, you know, what does that mean? Um, and, you know, with each of these, we it's helpful to contemplate, well, what does it mean? <laughs> it means that we continually have divine support, um, that we are not on our own. Um, that there is a power and a presence that is uh, supportive of life. And uh, as my teacher frequently said, we can learn to cooperate with it. And that's really um, the essence of yoga, the essence of any true spiritual path, which is learning the truth of what we are. And then 
figuring out how to live in harmony with that highest truth of our being. And the third sutra is, you know, we forget. We forget that that's the nature of reality. We forget that that's what we are. And especially when we're under stress, um, which everyone is right now, I, I can't imagine that anyone has escaped the stress of a global pandemic. Um, so when we're under stress, there's a tendency to, uh, unless one is stabilized in their spiritual awareness and practice, there's a tendency to um, uh, contract you know, and to uh, have the lower drives uh, and tendencies come into ascendancy, you know, the ego drives. And especially at this time, the need for control, which is an ego-based drive. The soul does not need to be in control. The soul is in complete harmony with the infinite. Um, But the ego, um, that sense of false self, needs to feel some sense of control. And of course, you know, right now things feel completely out of control. Mm-hmm. So there, there's a reaction from the lower drive, you know, that is expressed in, in, you know, so many different ways. How can I get control? And, um, and then there's a difference between how can I maintain more sanity and more peace than, you know, how can I, um, you know, control things. So, mm-hmm. so we forget, you know, and if we can come to the fourth sutra, which is we remember, then remembering that truth of our being, we can um, find a little more spaciousness. We can understand this lower drive to want to control things when we can't. Um, And we can then ask ourselves, uh, you know, better questions. You know, how can I um, remain spiritually grounded in this time? You know, how can I um, have this time be transformational, you know, who, who do I want to be, you know, as we come through this time and we look back, um, you know, what will we say about ourselves in terms Mm. of how we behaved? You know, did we follow our lower drives? Did we lash out at people with our anger and our fear? Um, Or did we cultivate, um, even in the most difficult situations, did we cultivate peace? Did we cultivate love? And did we express that to the best of our ability? Mm. I love the ending, you know, so obviously it is, we are it we forget, but I love the happy ending. We remember. (laughs) Yeah. And we may go through that process, you know, several times in one day. Yeah. Um, But the benefit of yoga practice is that we can, we're aware, we see, we, we can be aware when we forget. Um, In other words, when we, you know, um, get, uh, involved, you know, with uh, mind and emotions in a way that is not useful. And uh, we're forgetful of our uh, spiritual capacities. Um, And then we can remember and make a course correction. Yeah. So you, you touched on this and what you just said, but I wanted to dive in a little bit more deeply. You've spoken about Kriya Yoga philosophy and practice as being grounded in the truth of our being. And, and to me, this is one of the reasons that they offer such comfort because we feel this truth ourselves and then we can actually experience it you know in meditation which is why it's so important to you know have this regular meditation practice so we can feel that you know ground ourselves in that truth but would you say more about the difference between relative truth you know the truths like you know that are going on in the world right now we are in a pandemic etc and the absolute truth the truth of our being You know, some um, poets have said that the spiritual path is is like a razor's edge. Um, And, you know, there are lots of meanings to that quote, but I I think of it now in terms of how do we um, stay balanced in this world of relative truth and this world (laughs) of absolute truth, meaning, you know, absolute truth is the spiritual truth of life, the spiritual truth of our being. Absolute means, uh, you know, it is unchanging, unmoving, um, and, you know, always what it is. 
and a relative is something that changes. And so we're in a situation um, globally with the pandemic that is true. And there is a scientific um, investigation into those truths and science is true. Um, but science is relative, and so it changes. You know, we get more information, and it changes. So it doesn't mean that it's not true. It just means that it is subject to change. So, you know, for a yogi, we understand that at that level of truth, we need to pay attention to it. We need to be smart, um, but we also need to know that uh, what guides us at the highest level of our being is the absolute truth of of what we are. So what I meant by the razor's edge is that we have to hold fast to our deepest faith in the truth of our being as spiritual beings, and yet take in information that allows us to live sanely and wisely uh, in this time. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So we've talked about meditation, and we've talked about the importance of it in several different ways. So for those who perhaps haven't begun a meditation practice, maybe we should start there. So how do you, how do you start? How do you recommend people start? Well, it's really helpful to have a teacher, I think. And um you know, it's sort of difficult to learn from a book. So thankfully, you know, there are many opportunities online right now. And uh, at the center, we have that opportunity as well. You know, on Sundays where our program has moved online, there's meditation there and every day morning meditation is online. So um, just being able to start with some support and some guidance is is helpful. Um, and, and then, you know, sitting, just sitting for a period of time, you know, uh, taking a look at how do you meditate using a simple practice like observing your breath um, is very helpful. You know, even if you uh, didn't think of it as a formal meditation practice and you just sat down and uh, sat comfortably with your spine straight and uh, let the body be unmoving and you observed your breathing um, feeling the breath in, feeling the breath out, you, you would de-stress a bit and you would have the initial start of a meditation practice. Mm -hmm. And then for those who perhaps have used to meditate or are irregular, you know, meditators, um, what advice would you give there? I think, um, it just to, heed the call to meditation more frequently um, because of the interruption of routine um, you may not be able to have your practice as you had it before you know I mean uh, some people have you know family members uh, staying uh, sheltering in place with them and little kids and you know elders or whatever is going on so um, perhaps before you had you know more of an opportunity for that quiet space than you do now so I would say you know don't get frustrated if you cannot um, have the routine that you had before um, and meditate when you can and be alert for those moments of when you can just capture a little a time that's quiet where you can sit and um, and meditate. Yeah. I recently um, changed the area in the house where I was meditating, and it's just reminded me so strongly that it's really helpful to have a spot, you know, to have a place that you set aside for that. And and I do find that it calls me back, that there's like a little, <laughs> there's like a little voice coming from that area, you know, hello, <laughs> you know, come meditate. Uh, so that's been really helpful. I know you've, you've mentioned that to me, you know, many times in the past. Yes, it is helpful if you can have a place. And, um, and like I said, you know, many people are facing different situations at home. Um, things are much more crowded and, you know, people are home all day and all night. And so, um, you know, that 
that awareness that you can simply follow the call to meditate and uh, find a spot. And maybe your spot is, you know, out in the garden or going and sitting in your car in the garage, you know, um, <laughs> just being, you know, innovative um, to find a space where you can find it at this time and being attentive to that higher call uh, to meditate. Yes, absolutely. And again, from my my own experience, there's something about um, the regularity, the regularity of practice to really try and do something every day because we do forget and need to need to remember. And I think prayer is a great um, practice, prayer and mantra. Um, every day to have uh, some ritual. You know, we have many rituals. So even in the time of, of change, we still have many rituals that, that we um, have as human beings. So maybe your ritual is to have a cup of coffee or tea in the morning. Um, but have a ritual where you have a prayer or a mantra that begins your day. Mm, lovely. And with that, we've come to the break. You're listening to The Yoga Hour with host and founder of The Yoga Hour, Yogachari O'Brien. And we're discussing yoga, compassion, and resilience. Once again, Yogacharya offers many online classes and programs and has authored several books. And you can find out more at her website, ellengraceobrien.com and from the Center for Spiritual Enlightenment website, csecenter.org. We welcome your comments and questions. You can contact us at yogahour at unity.fm. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Discover the power within. Unity Online Radio. The voice of an awakening world. You're listening to The Yoga Hour, living the eternal way with your host, Yogacharya, Ellen Grace O'Brien. Welcome back from the break. I did want to mention that in addition to the uh, online programs uh, that I've already mentioned, there is um, a newer online program, a six-week online program that you can start at any time called Live the Eternal Way. And you can access that through Yogacharya's personal website at Yogacharya, I'm sorry, it's ellengraceobrien.com, not the yoga chart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in the first segment, we were discussing how yoga helps us be less fearful. And I did want to turn our attention now to compassion and resilience, two other benefits of practicing yoga. So why is compassion an important practice now? Compassion, of course, is always an important practice. And, um, you know, one of the things I learned about yoga, and I mentioned this a little bit in the first segment when we were talking about um, removing great fear, you know, that quote, just a little bit of this practice removes great fear. Um, I would say also that just a little bit of this practice begins to open us to our ability to be compassionate. Um, I think that, um, you know, a tendency that we have as uh, human beings, of course, we want to, um, you know, move away from suffering, move away from pain. We want to avoid it. And so... Uh, when it comes to pain and suffering, we we try to wall ourselves off from it generally, whether it is our own or somebody else's. We'd rather not see it. We'd rather not feel it. Um, but what yoga teaches us is that we don't have to wall ourselves off from it, that, you know, we are. Um, and what we are as spiritual beings is greater than that, just like the quote that you read at the beginning of the hour, um, and that we have resources within us that will allow us 
to actually touch suffering in a way that doesn't overwhelm us. I think that's why we tend to want to push it away. And of course, you know, during this time of the pandemic, there is there is a profound suffering and, you know, on a global scale, like we, we just have never seen uh, in our lifetimes. And um, so the tendency is to want to distract ourselves from that. Um, and, you know, however we do that, wherever we are, whether it's, you know, with food or, or alcohol or, uh, you know, exercise and, you know, whatever positive or negative way we try to distract ourselves. Mm-hmm. But um, yoga teaches us that if we can sit and touch the heart of our own being, we have enough strength within us that will rise up and allow us to be with the suffering in our own lives and in the life of the world. And of course, what's important about being compassionate right now is that, and at any time, is that it that it makes us better human beings. You know, we're not um, being pulled down by our reactive nature, you know, trying to um, control things, trying to keep out feeling um, but, you know, have that ability to to touch it, to keep our heart open and discover that as we do, you know, we have deeper resources than we knew. Mm. Yeah, that's a lovely way to put it. So obviously, this time presents so many challenges. Um, and it can be compa- it can be challenging to be compassionate with our closest family members if we are on top of each other uh, mm-hmm. 24 seven, um, every day, all day long. So mm-hmm. do you have any suggestions about how we can remember to be compassionate with others, particularly when we're irritated with them? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I was sort of chuckling because I'm, um, you know, when we first started this shelter in place, um, and my husband and I have a practice on Friday evenings as part of our spiritual practice. We have a Sabbath time. We light candles and we offer prayers and we offer our gratitude for everything that we have, all the blessings in our life. We pray for others. And then we um, renew our wedding vows every week. We've been doing this for, you know, 25 years and we we do it every Friday night and um, and 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 we reaffirm you know our our love uh, for one another and um so as we started this shelter in place thing you know i remembered uh, on a particular friday night that we had this you know experience of just love and opening our hearts and renewing that vow to to love and support and um and then by wednesday you know <laughs> the, the following wednesday it was a different scenario <laughs> And uh, so that was, you know, right there, like, wow, you know, um, because we were not used to, you know, being right, you know, underfoot with one another. We have a small home and we didn't have the ordinary space uh, that we had. So what I want to say about it is that, you know, it's a time for us um, to use our discernment and to cultivate our ability to rise up uh, to our higher potentials and not our lower drives. So as I said before, you know, we find during this time of stress that there's a tendency to want to contract and act out of the lower drives. But yoga is about um, cultivating the higher drive. So we have the ability to discern and you know, one of the things that I think will happen is that, you know, when you live with other people, there are little petty things that go on all the time. You know, it's just part of being a human being. And you you will have a partner or a family member 
that will say and do things that are just naturally annoying to you. And, you know, I've been married long enough to know that, you know, there are things that I do that are annoying (laughs) as well. (laughs) And, you know, under normal circumstances, we have a higher tolerance for that and we can get away from it. You know, we can just kind of let it wash off. But when we're under stress, even some of those same behaviors become exacerbated for us. And so what I want to say is um, be aware of that and just hold in your mind and your consciousness that everybody is under extreme stress. And so these behaviors that you find difficult are going to show themselves and your own reactive nature is going to show itself. And so I have a mantra for you. And the mantra is, now is not the time. (laughs) You know, now is not the time to try and change somebody in your family. Now is not the time to express your frustration that, you know, somebody uh, leaves their clothes on the floor. Um, You know, they've been doing that for however long they've been doing it. (laughs) And now is not the time to pick a fight about it. So um, and perhaps we could make it a positive affirmation and say now is the time, you know, to express love and compassion. But to remember, you know, now is not the time to express irritation. And that is very helpful. It's like, you know, oh, I need to expand my awareness at this time to um, a bigger space that allows um, people who are also under stress the space to, um, you know, not be um, perfectly as we would want them to be, because that's true of everybody. It's true even if you're working online with people you're working with, they're dealing with their own stressors in their house, um, as well as you dealing with the stressors in your house. So um, that's what I have been working with. Now is not the time, or if you want, now is the time, however you want to verbalize that. Mm Mm-hmm. I was thinking about um, about a pause and thinking about how my meditation practice allows me to take a pause. Sometimes I can be a little bit more removed and be in that witness consciousness and sort of watch myself mm-hmm. as I begin to be upset about something, mm-hmm. um, which is just another benefit of having that, of having that meditation practice on a regular, on a regular basis. It, re- it really is. And, you know, you've, you've put your finger on the exact mechanism and I would just say, you know, back one step is that while we're centered um, while we're centered and, and um, you know, open-hearted, that's the time to know that we have in our toolbox this practice, which is that I'm going to breathe, I'm going to pause, I'm going to say now is not the time, you know, to bring up an argument. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and so it, so that we're prepared, you know, in the heat of the moment. Um, because sometimes uh, we, if we haven't prepared ourselves, we don't know how to stop in the heat of the moment. So mm-hmm. sometimes we need to go in the other room. We need to do some deep breathing. We need to sit. We need to chant a mantra, um, you know, like that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so you mentioned this in passing in the, in the first segment about self-compassion. So in our practice of compassion, it, of course, is important to remember to be compassionate towards ourselves. So um, is there, what would you like to say about that? I mean, I think that sometimes that voice in our head that always reminds us how we could be doing so much better (laughs) than what we're doing (laughs) can be really merciless. Yeah, I think to understand that everybody is under profound stress and, um, Everybody, including you, or, you know, are doing the best that they possibly can at any given time. And um, so one of the things I noticed, you know, when the pandemic first came on that, you know, there's a <clears throat> there was a surge of 
you know, well, I can do this or I can do that. Or if I'm, if I'm going to be at home, you know, this will be a time when I can really, you know, get my exercise routine together. I can clean out all the cupboards and, you know, and then you may notice that, that you have not um, cleaned out all the cupboards. So you have not, you know, enhanced your exercise routine. And, you know, why is that? Well, it's because you're dealing with so many other pressures. And so, um, keep your goals realistic, you know, that will be helpful. And, you know, with this same understanding that you're giving to other people that they're under profound stress, um, you are also under profound stress and you also have very deep spiritual resources that you're bringing to bear at this time. And to notice that, you know, to notice um, the times during the day when you're making better choices, you know, when you're drawing from your spiritual practice, you know, um, you, you can lift those up and, and that will help to quiet the, the merciless, uh, critical voice. Mm-hmm. And provide a little bit of celebration of your, <laughs> you know, that one moment. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah. To celebrate that. <clears throat> So we mentioned in addition to compassion, one of the other benefits of yoga is resilience, that ability to rebound and get back up when we've been knocked down. So why do you think yoga is helpful in helping us build resilience? Well, in the most uh, simple uh, way, we can understand that yoga helps to remove stress you know, uh, physical yoga, asana, meditation, um, healthy lifestyle practices that we have, they all help to remove stress. (laughs) And that's exactly what we're dealing with. So um, yoga helps us, um, no matter what form of yoga you're practicing, unless, you know, and if you're practicing in the right way, and by that, I mean, not with, uh, too much goal orientation, you know, if you're, if, if you're, um, you know, practicing intensely and too intensely to try to remove stress, you're just going to create more stress, but, um, right. <clears throat> generally yoga, Um, is scientifically proven to remove stress from the system, you know, so through meditation practice, you calm the mind, you remove stress from the physical body. And, and that of course supports our immune system and overall helps us be more resilient. And, you know, it, it, it harkens back to what you were touching on in the first segment, which is our ability to, you know, be restored to wholeness, to return our attention and awareness to our essential nature and, you know, not be whipped around by the fear-based ego. And also I was reflecting touches on something you mentioned, which is that we have more resources than we realize. And that when we tap into those resources, it's, um, it, it, of course, resi- resilience, res- you know, arises because there is resilience there. You know, the the resources that we have come forth um, in ways that that can even be surprising. So, what practices, yoga practices, would you recommend to help us become more resilient? Uh, I think um, any of them, and you know, for somebody who's um, starting yoga practice, um, anything that you're inclined to do, you know, if you feel inspired to, um, take up an online asana practice, um, that will help with your resilience. If you, um, are a meditator and, um, or want to start meditating, that's going to help with resilience. Um, you know, if you're uh, studying uh, yoga philosophy, that will help because it will point you in the direction of inspired um, spiritual truth. Um, in the Kriya Yoga path, you know, we have three fundamental um, overarching practices that we refer back to again and again. And um, uh, I think those are useful to raise up at this time. You know, the first is to practice self-discipline. And, you know, we've really been talking about that throughout the program without naming it that, you know, when I talk about, you know, having a, a plan, 
uh, in place, you know, for yourself that you're going to say, you know, now's not the time, you know, now's not the time to have an argument, you know, now's not the time to pick on somebody or criticize or <clears throat> somebody else or ourselves or to say, you know, now is the time um, to have a healthy snack. Um, you know, that's, that that's all self-discipline practice. You know, now is the time more than ever to, um, meditate, um, more regularly. And I would say more deeply, you know, one of the, um, fundamental questions that arises at, you know, a time like this, uh, which is so threatening is what is my life really about and what is my highest priority? And so to the best of our ability in the disruption, in the midst of disruption in our lives, we can touch that deepest yearning to awaken fully in this lifetime. So it takes self-discipline to do that, to, to have that focus and to do what we need to do to be able to bring some attention and awareness to it. Um, and then, of course, the, the next overarching practice is to study, to contemplate the nature of reality, which we've also touched on in the program. And I would just add to that some form of reading every day. Um, you can surely carve out 10 minutes for some inspirational reading from scripture, from uh, the teachers of, of yoga in our tradition, you know, my teacher's writing, Roy Eugene Davis, Paramahansa Yogananda, um, great inspiration to help you stay balanced. And then the third practice, of course, is surrender, you know, letting go of the illusion um, that we're separate from the source, that we're on our own. And this is a great way to return to a sense of hope really, that there is a power and a presence that is um, is working um, to lift all of creation to its highest potential, even in our darkest hour, even in the most difficult time. Mm. Oh, such a really wonderful and important summary that you just gave of those three principles. So thank you. So one of the one of the things or the other tools of yoga is affirmation. So I was wondering if there was an affirmation that you would recommend we practice to help us stay hopeful at this time. Uh, I think um, there's really none better than the affirmation that my teacher, Roy Jean Davis, drafted, you know, over time. He had slight variations, but it goes something like um, the radiant uh, purity of my essence of being continuously illumines my mind and consciousness. The radiant purity of my essence of being continually illumines my mind and consciousness. So with sitting with that, contemplating that, you know, you're contemplating your essential nature and you're also affirming how that innate radiance of spirit um, supports uh, the mind and the body. Um, bringing forth that illumination of spirit to bring all systems into harmony, to bring peace to the mind, to clarity to the intellect, um, and um, harmony to all systems in the body. So it's a beautiful, beautiful affirmation. I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. And is there a tip that you would say of people who aren't familiar with practicing affirmation? Is there a time or a reminder of when you should do it? Um, I think it's helpful to write it down, write it down and uh, put it out where you can see it as a reminder. And of course, it's helpful after meditation, you know, when your mind is quiet, that you can reflect on that affirmation so you can feel it. You know, that's one of the key elements of a um, productive affirmation practice is to feel it, you know, not just say it, but to feel it. But I think uh, especially you just put it around and see it. Uh, have that reminder. That's lovely. So we've got about two more minutes, and I wanted to let you have the closing words. So uh, what words of in inspiration or encouragement would you like to leave with our listeners? I'm thinking about um, 
the the closing words uh, of the Bhagavad Gita. You know, in the in the Gita, there's a battle really that it points to the battle between the lower drives and tendencies and the higher drives of divine remembrance and uh, spiritual realization. And the Gita ends with the promise that you know wherever there is this struggle, you know, with the seeking soul and the higher self. Um, there will always be victory. Mm-hmm. And um, so to understand that we have that capacity in this time to have a spiritual victory and to have this time be transformational for us and to be liberating and healing. Mm-hmm. So I, I turn to <clears throat> that promise of the Bhagavad Gita, that where there is the seeking soul, Arjuna, and the blessed Lord, Krishna, the higher true self, there will always be victory. Mm-hmm. Such a lovely way for it, and hopeful, as you said, way for the Bhagavad Gita to end. And what we need, obviously, right now is 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 to keep that flame of hope alive mm-hmm. and in our hearts. Mm-hmm. Um through some of the tools we've talked about today. It's very, you know, useful. So with that, you've been listening to The Yoga Hour. It's been my pleasure to share this time with you. I'm Dr. Laurel Trujillo, co-host of the show, and we've been discussing yoga, compassion, and resilience with The Yoga Hour's founder and host, Yogacharya Ellen Grace O'Brien. Yogacharya O'Brien is an internationally acclaimed spiritual teacher, author, poet, and the founder and spiritual director of the Center for Spiritual Enlightenment in San Jose, California. Her books include The Jewel of Abundance and Living the Eternal Way, and a book of, po- well, many books of poetry, including The Moon Reminded Me. Her o- online classes include Live the Eternal Way, Dharma 365, and Arta 365, and those are wonderful ongoing programs that you can start at any time. You can find out more about her books, online classes at ellengraceobrien.com. Also, the Center for Spiritual Enlightenment now offers weekly Sunday satsang with Yogacharya O'Brien and morning meditation every morning online. You can find out more about those by visiting csecenter.org. Thank you so much, Yogacharya. It's just been delightful to be on the show with you today. Thank you. I've I've really appreciated this opportunity, and I I look forward to um, seeing many of our Yoga Hour listeners at our Sunday satsang or morning meditation. It's wonderful to see the global uh, online gathering that we've had. So everyone is welcome. Mm-hmm. Join us next week when Yoga Charya's guest will be Norman Fisher, the author of the book. The World Could Be Otherwise, Imagination and the Bodhisattva Path. They will be discussing creative imagination, a vision of hope for our troubled times. The Yoga Hour is a service project of the Center for Spiritual Enlightenment, a meditation center in the Kriya Yoga tradition. CSE welcomes people from all backgrounds who are seeking self and God realization, a path to spiritually conscious fulfilled living in today's world. Remember to subscribe to the Yoga Hour podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're enjoying the show, share it with a friend. Thank you to the Yoga Hour team, regular host, founder, director of the Yoga Hour, and today's guest, Yogacharya O'Brien. Actually, I should say maybe I'm the guest. (laughs) (laughs) Assistant producers Anne Hayes and Mickey Coronado. CSE's Global Media Outreach Manager, Holly Gray, and Jeff Comfort and Louis Pagan in the sound booth at unity.fm. I look forward to being with you again. Until then, remember, carry your own healing and wholeness within you. Share your peace and joy with all you meet. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Unity Online Radio, the voice of an awakening world.
If you're looking to deepen your spiritual journey, Unity Magazine is your go-to source for information and inspiration. It's been beautifully redesigned and packed with interesting articles and compelling interviews from today's spiritual thought leaders. You'll find science, spirituality, and healing with a look at Eastern philosophies, meditation, as well as completely new ways to interpret the Bible. Plus, reviews on the latest spiritual books and music. Get a free trial issue at unitymagazine.org.